I am Rebecca from Chemnitz, and it's time to leave no dye behind. I have remnants here of some mostly fluorescent acid dye colors. Uh, some, it's just a tiny bit of color left in the cup. Maybe it dried down a little bit in the last few days, so I'm going to add just some plain tap water to each of these cups. There is also potentially a little bit of dye left in some of these syringes. So these colors all started out as fluorescent acid dyes from Jacquard. Uh, we have a little bit of those six fluorescent colors. Uh, the black light blue, the fluorescent blue color, does have a little bit of some Jacquard turquoise mixed in with that. So I'm not expecting that that leftover is very fluorescent. Uh, anymore, but I also don't really know and I should be wearing gloves, but I do have glasses on so that is good <laughs> um, Actually, we can bring over my black light and see all right There is still a little bit of fluorescence in the blue But a bunch of these other colors are brighter and just for comparison's sake Here's the turquoise that is not fluorescent and our little bit of black light blue is a tiny bit. When I turn that on, you can see a little bit of the glow there. But just a tiny bit. So anyway, I don't know what we're gonna do with these more fluorescent colors yet, but I thought that we'd start with our turquoise. And today we're gonna be dyeing some Knit Picks Swish DK. This yarn is 100% superwash merino wool. Now I'm all gloved up and we have just some plain tap water here in this bucket, and I'm going to rinse out the cup. Uh, this is actually going really well. There's just like a tiny mint amount of blue left in here when I go and add a little bit of water. Uh, and so, man, having water on hand is really, really handy. <laughs> Normally, I have to go over to the sink to rinse things out because I don't think to bring water over to start with. All right. I'm coming in with 200 grams of yarn. And now, ooh, that is a very pretty color. Uh, what is really funny is that of the turquoise, maybe I had measured out max, I think, 0.2 grams uh, for my other projects. And we used a lot of that dye. And so this is a pale blue. Or me, yeah, probably like a pale blue versus like a super bright neon. But it's just amusing me because like if we had like a similar amount of dye from like black light blue, the color would be much lighter. But this color wise reminds me of a very saturated black light blue. And so that's just entertaining me. I'm gonna add, I don't know, three tablespoons of white vinegar. You can kind of see when I add the vinegar that this color does not strike super fast. It does take a while to bind to the yarn. And so I'm going to go take this over to the stove and we're gonna start heating it up. One of the big reasons why I decided to do things that way is that there's enough blue there that in theory it would have overpowered all of these other remnant colors that we have. Like it's possible that they would have shown up seeing the, the depth of shade there, but I figured we'll do a tonal and then we'll do something a little bit like more wild. So I've arranged our yarn in a little bit of a spiral, trying to keep the removable zip tie to the outside just for ease. And then I'm gonna add on a bunch of the pre-soak water, which maybe there was a tiny bit of soap in there. I mean, it's looking bubbly, so that is my hypothesis, but so we'll, we'll go with it. And let's add a lot of acid. Let's do four tablespoons of white vinegar. And now I don't know if that was three or four. Uh, we'll see on the recap. Either way, and let's add one more. Okay, so now we're at four or five. We don't really know. Um, now, this has a lot of water. This might look like a low level of water, but this is not a low immersion setup because... Uh, the wa the yarn is like pretty immersed. Um, I would call this more medium immersion versus low. I think that what I want to do now is take this over to the stove and start heating it up and then we'll add the rest of those remnant colors and just see what we end up with. But our acid 
acid ratio here is on the higher side. I don't know if we even have eight cups of water. Maybe we have approximately eight cups of water. So we definitely um, will, could have some colors strike faster, but a lot of these fluorescent pigments tend to take longer to strike anyway. So we'll see what we get, but our dye that we have left over is definitely like pink heavy. I think we have the most of the orange, red, and fuchsia, and less of the yellow, black light blue, and chartreuse. So I'm expecting this to be very warm toned. We are hot and steamy. I'm reducing the heat to low to hopefully remove some of that steam. And we're gonna start adding our colors. I'm gonna start with, I think this is our orange and just kind of layering it on. It might sink down some layers. We might have white left. Whatever we get is totally okay. Here I think is our fluorescent red. Is that the red? I think that's the red. So fluorescent red is still very, very pink, uh, as you can see right here, because it's not mega concentrated. But I think that this is our fluorescent fuchsia. Yeah, and so you can kind of see the difference, I'll put more of it next to the red, uh, between the hot fuchsia and the fluorescent red, which diluted still gives a pink, but it's more, uh, how would I describe it? There's definitely more yellow to it because you can mix a red out of a pink and a yellow. So I have a feeling that this has a combination of the fluorescent yellow pigments and that fluorescent pink. But speaking of our yellow, oh, that is so soft right now. Not very much of it left. And I think the same is gonna be true with the chartreuse, which I'm honestly gonna just layer here on top of that yellow. There is very, very little of it. Similarly, our blue, just a hint. Uh, almost no. Well, there we go. I don't know what's gonna happen beneath the surface here. All I know is that we had this tiny amount of color left and I wanted it to become something. I didn't want, and I'm not rinsing out the containers because I kind of like what happens and if there's blending, I wanna see how that goes. I mean, we probably have maybe a round eight cups of water, maybe a little bit less, and then four or five tablespoons of white vinegar. And again, we don't know what's happening down beneath the surface, but I'm excited to see. But now I'm gonna turn the heat back up a little bit and we'll heat everything for 30 minutes. Even though our other pot has been heating for a while, I hadn't set a timer yet, so both projects are gonna get 30 minutes. And now, why not chat a little bit? Why do I do this leave no dye behind thing? Because some of those cups had so little dye in there, why didn't I just rinse it out? And well, this really started as a financial thing. When I started filming videos, writing blogs on my dyeing process, I had more limited funds for materials and so I did not want to waste any of it because that could be enough for a project, something for me to create, I can use that for something. The other reason is an environmental one. If I can avoid pouring things down the drain, I'd like to do that. And so that is another reason why I try to soak up as much of the color as I possibly can. Now, there's definitely times when, especially using fiber reactive dyes on cotton, when I absolutely, absolutely have to leave some dye behind because that's the nature of the dye. But if I can't avoid it, why not? Another question that I get a lot has to do with my fantastic uh, black light, which is not plugged in. <laughs> Actually, this is the light clamp that I use for it. I don't usually clamp it on anything. You can find these at any like home improvement store, but it gives me a nice handheld light that I can use that makes some noise because the, oh, maybe does a screw in a little bit? Hey, it'll be less floppy, less noisy. But because this reflects the light, it sort of directs all of the light onto what I'm filming with. Um, but that's not what I was supposed to talk about. What I was gonna talk about is why the obsession with the black light? Like what situations would you use or wear fluorescent yarn and care about that? 
I have no idea if black light posters are still a thing, but as a kid I had tons of friends who had black lights and then these neon posters and you would have this like black light above it and so then the poster would go and pop. And so something about that was just always like, ooh, that's cool or fun. Or if you ever went to, gosh, was it the like, the roller skating rink? Uh, where then there would be like the black light and there would be like neon paint on the walls and it would just like be really bright. There's things like that and memories from my childhood I think that evoke this joy whenever I see the fluorescent colors. And so for most people in the real life situation, you may not have many scenarios where you're dealing with a black light. There may not be <laughs> situations where you get to enjoy those pops. But the fact that this is a feature of these fun neon colors, which look bright and neon under white light, it is something that is just fun to play with. Uh, as, <laughs> as, far, as far as my adult life goes, I know places like the New England Aquarium have some black lights and there might be other places that do as well. Maybe some like putt-putt golf in the dark those kinds of places where they're dark and they have black lights, uh, places like that. And it's just, it's fun. Fluorescence is fun. Now, as someone with a scientific background, fluorescence is awesome and really, really cool. And there's a lot of fun things you can do with fluorescent proteins to actually give you information about where things are located in a cell um, or what things might be close in proximity to one another. There's a lot of really cool things that you can do with it scientifically. And man, I just remember even being excited about a fluorescent blue protein, which wasn't, I don't know about now, but when there was this talk and someone was trying to make that, uh, I just thought that that was so, like, it was like so cool uh, trying to engineer proteins to have more colors so that way you could do more research with different types of fluorescent molecules. But anyway, that is a little digression, but it's something that I do often answer down in the comments. I do try as much as possible to read and reply to questions as best I can. Uh, and so that is one of the best ways to ask any questions. And then also sometimes you guys all help me out and someone else can answer the question before I get to it. But anyway, I, let's now wait for that timer to go off so we can go look at the yarn. The timer just went off and whoa, color spread. Oh my gosh. So we have like a hint of green left in here. Um, but otherwise, like this really resembles some rainbow sherbet. Uh, it does look like all the color has absorbed. So I'm going to turn off the uh, heat and we're going to let this cool off for a bit before I go ahead and wash it. And as for our blue, which definitely is heated for longer than 30 minutes, the dye bath is clear. Can you see the dye bath? Yeah, you can see the dye bath. The dye bath is completely clear, probably because we don't have that much dye there. Um, but again, I'll just let it stay in the pot and cool off. Um, I'm not going to wash the yarn for a while anyway. And then we'll go ahead and wash the cooled off yarn. I might remove it in a tiny bit, but for now, it just makes sense to leave it on the stove. <laughs> There's no harm in the yarn getting a little more heat. Unless, of course, well, there might be some scenarios where you're worried about that. But this is not one. In this case, there's no harm in letting it sit longer. Let's wash all of this yarn. And what do you think? Should I have combined it all together? Uh, we actually have some good contrasting colors between the blue and the like pink and orange. I think that those could be used together in a project in a really, really pretty way. Let's add a little bit of dish soap while we're filling up the basin. I'm optimistic that we're not going to see any bleeding, but so far so good. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious to know if you guys would have combined everything into like one color because while like, I don't know if I would have done the space nine with the blue and the other colors that would have overpowered it, but we could have you know, done the blue and then added the other colors on slowly. That could have been really nice and pretty. Uh, let me know in the comments what you would have picked if you had this palette and these kinds of 
portions of colors left over. I'm just excited because I like these colors. <laughs> but anyway, we are not seeing any color bleeding, which is always wonderful when we're dealing with a turquoise or fluorescent colors. So I'm gonna just rinse one more time to finish rinsing out the soap. Then I'm gonna put the yarn through my spin dryer and then hang it up to dry. Before I talk too much more about this yarn, when I originally measured out the turquoise dye, there was a max of maybe a quarter of a gram. And I used a lot of that on another project. So we have less than a 0.1% depth of shade of the color here. This right here is a 1% depth of shade of black light blue. The 4% depth of shade of black light blue is <laughs> darker uh, for sure, but you can just tell that the pigmentation is very, very different. And I mean, I know this isn't the point of our project today, but I can't resist talking about this. The other thing that might be a little hard to see is that turquoise, and actually this could be the yarn base because it's a low depth of shade, Swish DK is a little bit more yellow than Stroll, but right here, the turquoise absolutely looks a little bit more green and the black light blue looks more like a cool toned blue. But that could be just because there's so little of the turquoise dye that some of the off-white yarn is showing through. So that may not be as much of a conclusion as I thought. And now I can't resist popping on my black light and showing which we expect that black light blue, that skein is fluorescent and uh, the turquoise is not. <laughs> not at all. But actually, since I have the lights off, you may as well look at all of this and you can see that our more variegated stain is quite fluorescent. Uh, some of those areas like with that orange definitely have more of a pop when the colors are spread out more. We see less of the fluorescence. But yeah, this is just pretty fun and exciting. I'm really glad that I split the yarn into two different projects because I think that we could have had something pretty if we had combined the turquoise with these warmer colors, but then I also think we would have ended up with something significantly more muddy here. And now we have two things that honestly have enough contrast that you could work them together for some kind of fun, summery, tropical kind of pattern. Of course, one where you also want to be wearing superwash merino wool. I am Rebecca from Chemnitz, and I love to use up my leftover dyes. And frequently, this involves combining things together even when we're not sure what's going to happen with those combinations. But please let me remind you that you're not required to combine everything together. You can take your leftover dyes from one project and turn it into things that are completely different. And sometimes they still go together really, really beautifully. I am Rebecca from Chemnitz. Make sure you subscribe, turn on notifications, do all the YouTube -y things. It's the biggest way you can help support the content here. Thank you so much for watching.